Hello and welcome back. Today I'm going to show you how to use creative attachments to connect different pieces of metal to each other. We don't always want to drill a hole in the face of our jewelry and pop a jump ring through it to connect it to another piece. It can take away from our design um, and it's a little bit more professional to hide those attachments. So I'm going to show you three different ways to connect your metal to either another piece of metal or to your chain. The first route I'm going to show you is something called a bale. The second route I'm going to show you is using tubing on the back of your piece. And the third route I'm going to show you is using something called a ball-ended wire. Take your time when you're using the torch. Make sure you're following the safety precautions of goggles on, hair up, any loose clothing tied back. And of course, when you're buffing, do the same. Um, otherwise, enjoy, have fun, and see what you can do as you add the techniques in your metal smithing toolbox. Right in front of you, you can see all the creative attachments that I'm going to teach you today. This is a bale. It's a piece of thin metal that's been bent back on itself and connects down to the base. This is ball-ended wire. There's a hole in each piece here. There's a wire with a ball on each end that holds the piece in place. And on the back, I have tubes. This is using tubing, which is the other um, route for creative attachments that I'm going to show you today. So three different ways to connect your pieces either to themselves or to chain. The first technique we're going to talk about is creating a bale. A bale is just looping a piece of metal back up on itself to connect it to something else. We use bales when we do linked pieces if you've watched that video, but we can also use a bale to connect directly to a chain or to connect to wire for beading. So this piece has two bales and it will be connected at both points onto the chain um, that will go around the neck. Make sure when you're designing for a bale that you give yourself at least an inch of length and material to bend back on itself. So you've got enough room there to work with. You also wouldn't want your metal to get much thicker than this is, otherwise it's difficult to find a jump ring that's going to fit it, um, or to cut a hole large enough in another piece of metal to fit without it really impacting the design. To make a baled um, connection, what you need is a long, section of metal that you're going to bend back on itself. Get that piece ready for solder. So this piece is ready to go over to the soldering bench. It's cut, filed, and it's clean and sanded um, to 300. And then what you're going to do is you're going to bend your ends just like you would if you were making a link. So you're going to use your flat pliers. You're going to grab the very, very tip of your piece and you're going to bend it towards yourself. Okay, so you've got an angle about like that. Then you're going to take your round pliers right beneath that bend and you're going to spin it back on itself so it touches in the back. So you can see how this is going to touch flat here. Now it's not touching quite yet and I actually need to open it up so I can flex that joint at the soldering bench. Once that joint's been flexed I'm going to push it down and solder with hard solder. I'm going to do that to both ends and then I'll go over to the solder bench and show you next step. All right, I have everything that I need to solder down for this piece. I've got my branch with the bales, I've got the back piece, and I've got my bezel. What I'm gonna do now is flex everything. If you look at my branches, you can see that they're covered in this green substance. I carved this before I brought it over so there's a texture in there. And as you guys know, solder sometimes likes to creep up on top of overlay, the soldered pieces on top. And if that creeps up into my texture, it's gonna be really hard for me to get that solder out. So I applied this, which is a kind of a solder resist. Um, I'm using Rio Stop Flow is what I've used, but whiteout works just as well. So my first step in doing this bale is to solder these two pieces down, and then I'm gonna solder everything down to this back piece. So right now I'm gonna work on flexing, and remember when you flex a bezel, turn that flame down. Flexing the bale can be a little bit tricky because you need to make sure you're coming in with your flux at an angle that gets both the inside top and inside bottom of your bale. And you can see me here moving things around and setting it up in different ways to achieve that. I'm also going to flux the other components of my piece so when I'm done soldering the bale, I can solder the rest on the front. My first step is going to be to solder my bales down. In order to solder my bales down, I'm going to use a hard solder. Um, and when I solder this branch and my bezel to the silver back piece, I will use easy solder. So hopefully those bales 
stay soldered shut. I'm gonna use a slightly bigger piece of hard solder. Um, and when I say bigger, that's within the realm of solder sizes. Um, so you can see that size there potentially. I'm gonna place it right underneath where that bale gets pushed down. And then once I have my solder in that joint, I'm gonna push the bale or the bezel down into position using a pair of pliers. Once you've pushed down your bales, make sure that the solder hasn't fallen out of the joint, and if it has, replace it. Then you're going to heat the joint and make sure that you push down the tip of the bale when it's hot enough to solder, and double check that your soldering job is complete before you put it into the pickle. If you're doing a second solder job on the piece, make sure you use easy solder in the next step so that you maintain the joint on your bale. The last step on the bale is connecting it to something else. If I was going to use the bale to connect to other pieces of metal, what I would have done is opened up the bale, I would have put the other piece of metal through the bale before I soldered it, I would have taken it over to the bench and then soldered it shut so that piece would be in and connected through the bale during the soldering process. And you can see this technique done um, if you go back and watch my Lynx video. It's the same technique as we're using on the bale. I'm using this bale, however, to connect to a chain. So the first thing I need to note is the thickness of the bale, because I'm going to apply or put a um, jump ring through the bale. So this little jump ring, which it would be nice to use, is much too small. This one is too large, but I'm gonna use it today just so you can see how this will work, all right? The jump ring gets opened up and put through the bale, and then I would cut my chain and run the jump ring through the chain. I'm not gonna cut this chain right now because I'm not going to use this chain to finish this piece. Um, this is gonna become a beaded necklace. So I just wanna illustrate the process for you here. I'd want to run the jump ring through the link of the chain um, like so, and then it would go up to the top and I would, I would uh, reseal that jump ring. So again, I don't have a hole in the face of my piece. I just have a nicely finished piece. Alternatively, if I just had one bale, um, and in this case I have two, I don't think it would look nice on this, but if there was just a single bale, what you can do is treat it as a slider. I can run the chain through the bale, and then it would hang down like so. Obviously that's not the intention for this necklace. Sometimes students will want to run the chain through both sides of a bale, and if you're gonna do a double bale, um, depending on your design, this could look really nice. On this design, it's not the best look, right? That's not the intention for this piece. But a bale can be used as a slider on a chain, or you can cut your chain in half and connect the chain directly to the bale with a jump ring. Again, a really nice way, a really strong way to connect your piece to a chain. Um, you're not gonna have that chain slip out of a bale. The next technique we're going to do is using tubing on the back of our piece to allow us to give a place to connect things that are hidden from the viewer in the front. So when I turn my piece over, you can see the two little pieces of tubing on the back are connected to a jump ring, which then connects to a chain. You could also use tubing to connect multiple pieces of metal to each other. Just make sure you get them close enough to the edge that a jump ring is going to be able to connect one piece of tubing to one on the next piece. It's a really lovely technique. The first step to use tubing as an ultimate connection is to sand the tubing itself. As you can see, this piece of tubing has gotten pretty dirty over time, so I want to sand this surface and make sure I have a nice, clean piece. I'll also sand the end so I make sure that all metal is clean. Then I need to cut as many pieces of tubing as I'm going to use, and I always cut extra because they tend to roll away and get lost. To cut the tubing, you're going to put the tubing at the very end of the V in your bench hook. You're going to take your saw. You're gonna start your line about, that's about um, an eighth to a quarter inch in on the tubing there. Cut almost all the way through. If you cut all the way through, it's gonna to wanna to pop off on you and roll away. So if you cut almost all the way through, you can bend it back and pop it off and then cut as many pieces as you need. Done sawing, you're gonna take all of your work over to the solder bench and flux. Make sure you use a smaller flame to flux your tubing. 
Once you have everything flexed completely and make sure you've done all the sides of the tubing, you're going to set up your piece on your soldering block. To solder down my tubing, I want to think about where and how I want my chain or other pieces to connect to my piece. So in this case, I want the chain to come off at an angle on either side of my piece. I'm going to lay my tubing on its edge in the location and the angle that I want to have my piece um, sit. Then I'm going to use hard solder, one piece, and I'll push that, put the little piece of solder down onto my piece and then I push it underneath like it's a doorstop on the tubing. Make sure you use a big enough piece that you're going to get a little pool underneath your tube, but not so big you're going to get a humongous spill of solder out and around it. Make sure that solder is tucked underneath like a little doorstop that allows the solder to flow onto both the tubing and onto the back piece. When you're heating the piece, make sure that you pick a flame that's an appropriate size for the metal you're using, and you're going to want to try to avoid heating the tubing directly because it's much smaller than the metal it sits upon. If the tubing does like this guy, it wanted to move a little bit, I'm going to pause, move it back. And I'm heating until I see that little silver ribbon of solder go underneath my tubing and around it. My tubing's going to get hot before my metal around it does. So the solder's melted, but it hasn't gone underneath the tubing yet. I can see that it is not there. I'm going to move my tubing so that it sits into the solder a little bit nicer. All right, that looks good. At this point, I'm going to put easy solder on the back of my um, overlay that's going to go on the front. I'm going to pre-melt that, um, and then I will heat that and solder that down. As a reminder, I'm using easy solder on the leaf. That way, when I heat up the leaf on the front of the piece, I'm not going to remelt the solder on the tubing in the back, keeping that secure. To connect two pieces using the tubing, what you're going to do is just simply use a jump ring through the tubing and the next piece. So if you've got another piece here with tubing, you would apply a jump ring to connect the two or three jump rings if you need more space. I'm going to be connecting my tubing directly to chain. So I'm just going to use my pliers like I always do with a jump ring, open up my jump ring, um, slip it through the tubing and then through the chain and then close tightly. Anytime you use a jump ring to connect to chain, it's really important that you make sure that that jump ring is closed very, very tight, or the chain can slip out of the jump ring, and that's when we lose components of jewelry. So take the time to go back and forth and close them tight. And it's as simple as that. And in the end, you really don't see the connection for the chain. It's hidden behind the piece, out of the way of the viewer, and um, gives you a really nice, smooth finish to the front of your piece. The last technique I want to show you for connecting things in a creative or a different way than just jump rings is something called ball-ended wire. I've used it on the same necklace that I have the tubing on the back of this piece. If I scrunch down here a little lower, you can see these two little spheres here and here. They pass through a hole that I've drilled in the metal in each of these pieces and around to the back side. So it's a piece of wire with a sphere on each end. It's a really quick and easy technique uh, and I think you'll enjoy it. So let's get started. The first step for doing a ball ended wire is to cut a piece of wire. So I have one here. I'm gonna put it into, this is called a third hand, but you could also hold with the tweezers as long as you have a large enough tweezer. And what we're gonna do is melt the end of the wire it'll kind of pull up on itself and form a ball. So I'm gonna light my torch, I'm gonna to come right up below the end of the wire with the cone of the flame, and I'm gonna heat, and it's gonna form a little ball that pulls up the length of the wire. Okay, you see that little ball, that little sphere there? I'm gonna do the other end, not because you need to do the other end with this, but just to show you one more time how that works. And remember, assume things are hot on the bench, don't touch with your hands, touch with tweezers or do a really careful gentle touch before you go too, too far. All right, here we go. So watch the end of that wire. You 
see it forming a ball, it just kind of claw climbs up the length of the wire. If you go too long with the spear, um, it'll fall off, but that's all you do. You pop it into the pickle, um, and then you take it over to the buff. You can buff it up straight from this point, and then I'll show you next step once I have my next piece ready. For assembly with a ball-ended wire, you want to have all of your pieces um, finished. Your ball-ended wire has been polished. You're simply going to drill holes in every connection that you need, feed the wire through the hole on the front side where you want the ball to show. Then you're going to pull the wire up at a 90 degree, like so, and then feed it onto the next piece. Now there's two things that you can do here. Thing one is I could feed it onto this piece, take it over to my um, soldering bench, and ball end, push this all the way down, put my um, tweezers here and ball end this wire, and then bend it up, it'd be a double ball ended wire. Or I can flip this around on itself, twist it around the center point, and have kind of a twisted wire on the end. I wanna do a double ball ended wire, so I'm gonna hold this here, I'm gonna trim this end here, take it back to my torch, hold these pieces above the torch, ball end the wire here, and then I'll show you how that looks. All right, I ball ended that other end of the wire, so all I'm gonna do is take my piece and bend it into the position that I want it to stay in. You can see how that wire passes through both. I'm gonna come in with my um, pliers and just kind of make sure that's nice and straight and then I'll probably take it over to the buff, buff it up or at least sand it um, so there's a nice finish to that wire as well. And at this point I'm ready to put this on any chain that I'd like and I've got um, tube settings on the back to connect to my chain.